first, the first time I uh, found out about IONS, I went to Dr. Jan Holden's group in DFW, and it was a small little group in a church, and and beautiful people shared their stories, and the stories really touched me. And Dr. Holden was a great mentor because she took interest in my story, and she really just supported me on my journey and other people on their journeys. And I think that's so key to people who run these IONS groups is not to come from any any idea of how the experiencer should present their story, but really just support us as individuals because really we come from this consciousness that we connected with on the other side. And then we come back to this body, this life, this age, and we have to navigate the world. And those early groups with IANS were just amazing. And honestly, I never thought I would tell my story widely. You know, I was happy to be just a part of my local group. So at that level, IANS does amazing work and there's amazing people and there's so much healing that comes from sharing these stories. So I was, I was blessed to meet people who maybe they'd had a similar experience or awakening, or maybe they were just curious. And these these sharing groups in person were amazing. And then Dr. Holden introduced me to the I Survive crew um, beyond and back. And so that was kind of a big deal. I thought, okay, I will tell my story and that will be it. You know, one television program, end of story, no more. And, you know, this will be out there for people to see who really are interested in these stories. And then I just kind of forgot about it. I went on with my mission. And if you're not familiar with my particular near-death experience story, I died when I was in college and I had a car wreck. And during surgery, I saw angels working through my surgeon to help heal my body. And I was agnostic at the time. So that totally (laughs) changed my worldview, this idea of higher beings assisting these brilliant neurosurgeons. And I had a verifiable detail in my experience with with, uh, seeing something out of body and researchers, as you know, uh, love those details because in a sense, it's proof of of the afterlife or consciousness surviving form. But what was important to me was how changed I was because of this experience. And my experience was deep and long and profound. I mean, it was only two and a half minutes, but it felt long (laughs) on that timeless side. But I was given a particular mission to teach. So I didn't think my mission in any way was centered around telling the story too often. I told it to groups of students and really that was just to center the light in their their lives and to make them less afraid of death and really just to share the most profound story of my life. So at that time, when I told my story to the bio channel, I had no interest in continuing on, but I was grateful for the community. I was grateful for Dr. Holden's support. And then many years later, I think in 2016, she introduced me to a National Geographic researcher who was looking into near-death experiences and writing an article. And there was something about the world in 2016 that when I was interviewed for that that magazine article, something shifted inside of me. And I thought, you know what? It is time for me to write my story. It's time for me to tell this because empathy is important. And I have great empathy for the journey of others. And I have spent now at this point, 25 years creating community with students. And I've found that community is deeply healing because when we let go of our ego and we become one with a small group, even in a class, there's something incredibly healing about that. When I see other students support one another, when I see other students wish the best for one another, when I see students give good energy to people who they normally wouldn't interact with, who they normally wouldn't even know um, and would probably just pass on the street and never get to know, but they do get to know one another in class. And I've found that, you know, a lot of this division in society can be completely broken down when we get into groups and share our hearts and share our journeys. And I think it's vital. So I think classrooms are vital. I think sharing groups and at IANS and ISCO are vital 
because there's something about that connection that we need and there's something about it that releases our fear and reminds us that hey we're all struggling and <laughs> if you notice my background is less than stellar i've had to take a uh, break from youtube because i'm moving under great duress <laughs> i won't even go into all of that but there is just a lot going on in my life and if it wasn't for community then i don't know how we'd make it you know honestly and so i know that community has supported my students through tough times and i know it has supported me through tough times and and so what is the future of community and what is the future of all this i'd like to still stick with my story about why i started speaking publicly because this has a lot to do with ians and a lot to do with that this anniversary i I think there are people who are part of IANS who will sit in the background and maybe they've had a near-death experience and maybe they're happy just to be supported in groups or to just listen. Then there are people who take a chance and begin to speak and they're afraid. And then there are people who are pushed forward by circumstances and by, by opportunities and by this need to speak. And then sometimes guidance steps in and requires us to do more. So. I was terrified when National Geographic interviewed me because I knew that this was a turning point in my life and I knew that I was going to speak more publicly. And if you don't fully know my story, I have a stalker and there's there's just a lot of uh, forces even within my family that don't want me to speak openly. So I was terrified. I went into great meditation you know, for days before I contacted this, this uh, woman from National Geographic and before I made my first video for YouTube and I felt these angels setting above me. And you know we'll call them guides, angels, light beings, and they were hovering in the sky and they said, it's important that you make your first video on YouTube, that there's a lot of people who are gonna see this and who need this and who will be in great pain and they'll be at pivotal points in their awakening. And of all things, they showed me the country Spain as a particular area where my story would reach a lot of people. And very quickly, that first video that I made on YouTube was translated into Spanish. And I, I interact with people from Spain who, who really are in this moment of awakening and needed my story. And so I love it when there's confirmation from the other side, but I got this confirmation that yes, indeed, I needed to make that first video. And then I started having fun and interviewing other people. And that National Geographic story was very minor. You know, it was like a, just a blip, which told a little bit about my near-death experience. And it definitely didn't tell the whole story. So I wrote my book, Angels in the OR because I wanted people to understand that we all come from different places. We set our feet on the ground at different places, even though we, you know, all, every near-death experiencer who's had that profound experience and has left their body and gone, you know, close to the light understands that we are so much more than this body, but they also understand that we come back to this life. We come back to our set of circumstances and we come back changed, but yet we're back here in this body. And I wrote that story because I knew there would be other trauma survivors. I knew that there would be, you know, young people who had not yet broken away from their families and who felt, you know, maybe even stalked by family members, or maybe their near-death experiences were caused by family members. A lot of children who have near-death experiences have these because of neglect, assault, you know, di different forms of abuse. And so it's very tricky when family members stay loyal <laughs> to those people who actually caused death in, in children. And so I knew I would be speaking for people who were under um, a lot of pressure or who couldn't speak at that moment about their experiences. And I knew that I had to be that person you know who would break open doors in a way for some people and that that has always been i guess my role i'm a generation xer and i think many of us this small generation are just tough and we 
we know that we don't like this society, many things about it, and we're rebellious and we're willing to knock things over. And so, you know, people in authority are sometimes like, who are you? <laughs> you know, why are you doing this differently? But it has to be done differently in order to reach this big group of millennials who I've been teaching for so long and who I love so much. So I've been creating community with that group of millennials for so long now. And I feel like I understand that generation and I understand that, that, um, you know, that desire that they have to express themselves, but from this really, from a different place than perhaps my generation, from a really calm and beautiful place of, of healing and community. And I think community is important to that group. So what is the future of spiritual community? And how do we support one another? One thing that I've thought a lot about is who am I in this landscape and how can I support others? And this year when I, I lead summits online and interview different people, I decided to bring in other podcasters and really just promote their shows and really be that person who brings other people together to celebrate other people because it gets boring self-promotion. <laughs> like it's, um, you know, it's, it's not fun. It's so much more fun to be a part of a group and promote this overall connected message, at least to me, you know, and it, it kind of is a turnoff after a while. I mean, I understand, you know, early on, it's a big deal when you publish a book and you're excited about getting a publisher and you're excited about, uh, you know, launching it and all that, but, uh, you know, post after post about my book, my book, my book, it's, it's tiring, you know, it's tiring to, um, to hear and it's tiring to do. So how do we work as a group? Well, we just celebrate one another and we also support one another because here's the thing, it's not a competition. So a lot of times people think, oh, well, this person in this hierarchy is more evolved, or this person is like almost all the way to enlightenment, and this person is almost there. Mm, no one's enlightened. Like, I've met gurus around the world. I've met, you know, so many famous near-death experiencers. I've met so many. No one is enlightened. And well, the minute you put someone on a pedestal, you're going to be disappointed by them. So I believe this is not the age of gurus. This is the age of community. And there is just such a profound need for that community. So one of the things that is important to me is conversation, honest conversation about our real lives. So the the thing that is important with community is conversation. <laughs> and how do you facilitate good conversations between people? Well, it's not a top-down type of conversation. It is a, a listening to everyone and a, a willingness to know that we're all on a learning journey. So when you take people off a pedestal, and you just learn from one another, then it just becomes so much more fun. And I think many teachers know this in the classroom that I've learned time and time again from my students. Now, have I learned grammar from them? No, <laughs> but, but have I learned life lessons? Yes. And I think that's the, uh, that's the thing that is important as you see from, well, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So I'm moving under great duress and I have a ton of stress in my life, but I walk into a community college classroom and I have students who uh, work night shifts and they show up in the morning for my class. Not a morning person, I'm very tired. So I do not say that I'm tired in the morning because I know there are students who have been up all night long and are staying awake in order to take this class and, and shift the dial in their own lives into a different dimension. And that is just profound to me. I'm always humbled. So no matter the amount of trauma that I've gone through, no matter the amount of grief, I encounter students who've lost their whole families to uh, shootings, you know, who have lost their entire life savings in, um, 
you know, in absolute disasters. And so when I encounter these students and I see that they're surviving and they're looking to me for help and for guidance, then I get this strength that, uh, that really does come from the other side. And I get kind of choked up about that because when we're in motion, helping other people, we become so much more than we are. And that's, that's what I've learned time and time again is that no matter how difficult it is, no matter how many times I think I can barely put my foot in front of the next foot, I get into the classroom and it all evaporates. And there's so much joy, there's so much connection, and there's so much love. And is it always that way in spiritual community? No, <laughs> you know, that's that, I mean, it is sometimes, but it isn't always. And so I think that's the lesson for all sp spiritual communities is when you come together in humility, when you come together as just human beings who want to learn more together and who will want to evolve together and who want to heal together, then you really do start bringing in magic. And that's, that's my message to IMs, to um, you know, all spiritual communities is to kind of get rid of the ego. And it's hard to do, oh my God, but it is important because when you enter with humility and you meet people at that level, then you really just, the barriers just start to fall away and they start to become just uh, translucent in a way. And you see love um, just happen between people. And I'll, I'll give you, you know, cute examples. So some of my students come from diverse backgrounds. And uh, one year I had a student who he was going to be a football player for a major university, but had an accident and ended up in community college. And he was paired up with um, some girls for a service learning. And one of the young women was a pageant winner, you know, a beauty pageant winner. And, um, you know, they were different races, different, uh, different eco socioeconomic backgrounds, and they never would have spoken to one another. But when they did, something magical happened. They didn't date or anything, but they, um, they just understood one another as human beings. And those barriers dropped away. And both of them wrote in their essays how excited and happy they were to meet someone who had lived such a different life from them, but they saw the humanity in each other and they really wished the best for one another. And I think that energy of wishing the best for others and dropping judgment is one of the lessons from my near-death experience. And to put that into action is powerful. So when you are leading a spiritual community, when you're part of a spiritual community, I think helping people get rid of judgment and seeing the soul and the spirit of other people is just a key important component of that. So how do you do that? You let people talk to one another. You know, you pair them up in diverse groups and you give them work <laughs> to accomplish in this world, actual work, you know, digging in the dirt, planting gardens, um, helping society in some way. And there's so much talk in spiritual communities that I get really irritated. There, there needs to be a lot more doing because at a community college, there's a lot of doing. You know, there's a lot of, we go out and we perform service learning. We feed the homeless. We do things that like churches do. And I think that those acts of service are just profound. And it's in some ways better than sitting at a conference, you know, that that when you work together to make this world better and you just drop all ego and you see that, well, here's your college president digging a hole or helping um, put on a roof and then, you know, he's talking to a fellow student, then, you know, you just feel like we're all one, you know, that there isn't this designation of hierarchy that we're all working towards a common goal towards a common good. So what is the common good that we near-death experiencers are working towards? I think we need to start imagining it. I think we need to start creating it. And I think we need to start doing it in the world. I think we need to start working together and creating the type of world that we want to see. 
through service, through action, through, you know, not worrying about bottom line <laughs> dollars, but worrying about what are we doing? What is our legacy? What are we contributing? Uh, that is vital. And, you know, it does have a beautiful effect. So a lot of my students who are involved in service do become more successful because they're a part of the community and they understand the lineage of uh, how they grew up poor. They're coming to college thinking that maybe they're going to, you know, get the skills that they need to succeed. But what they find is that when they reach back and they help other kids succeed in ways that no one helped them, then they gain this strength and this magnetism to go out into the world and step into that next level. And that next level is being a leader in some ways, usually. And how do we do it? You know, this is, and in some ways I have more questions than answers. I have some answers, but these answers come from years of teaching. And, and what, I've, what I've come to realize is that I was given this mission of teaching both for myself, but also because it's the perfect blueprint and the perfect model for creating a better world. So how do you do that? You create community, you imagine together and you work together. And that is the formula. And, and so what do we do as near-death experiencers? Many of us have talked behind the scenes about how we should get together and combine our energy and not have individual presentations, but you know, maybe at the end of IADS have like a massive presentation where we're just giving energy and just sending that energy to people who are in pain and sending that light to help those who are in pain evolve and move past a great, um, a great trauma. So, you know, that's one idea. There are other ideas of well, you know, there are, there are ways that we could go to moments of tragedy and we could offer our services to people who have experienced something profound. So a lot of people are frightened by the negative near-death experiences, the, the ones that predict a lot of violence in America. So I always think about what can we do to combat that? And so interrupting violence is something that I've learned about in education and there are certainly people who've done this and it has had profound effects but they aren't necessarily from the spiritual community they they're more from the intellectual community you know they're they're people who simply just understand that violence spreads like a pandemic spreads and how do you stop it where there is violence, you must go in and create peace from people who understand why that violence occurs and can talk to people and bring them down into a different mindset and teach them different skills and teach them how to handle uh, the moment that they're going through. And I think that near-death experiencers have a particular skill set of understanding that that transition to the other side is such a beautiful one, no matter whether it comes from murder or mass shooting, what, no matter how you transition, once you transition, it's beautiful. And I think that knowing can be very healing for communities and we're not afraid of death. So I think, you know, like for lack of a better term, there needs to be like a group of near-death experiencers and healers who are willing to step in to areas of violence and help people after that moment and help that violence not to spread. And, you know, how is that going to be funded? And how is that going to happen? You know, in the in the world, people get so angry, you know, when people make money from their books or from various um, endeavors. But what if we had a mission? You know, and what if this mission was funneled into something that was clear, you know, that we are we are stopping, you know, this from happening by providing light and healing in these communities. I think, you know, we try to do things separately. And I, I look at the near-death experiencers around the world and, you know, we're trying to do things individually in our areas, but collectively we can do so much. And one of the things that has also come to me during the past couple of years is that there's going to be massive breakthroughs in healing. And one of the 
one of the things that really shocks me and I don't even fully understand it is that no matter what industry you're working in, if you're feeling a calling to move into healing, it's probably the right calling. <laughs> so that, that may be terrifying to many people. It may be frightening, but healing is just the antidote to the division. It's the antidote to the violence. It's the antidote to uh, really disconnection. So community and healing. So I, I talk with lots of people who are terrified to leave their careers, but they know that they want to do something differently. And how do you do that? You know, how do you step out and do this? So I think the first step is just doing it. You know, it's just literally not talking about it anymore, but doing your best to create what you want to create. And I can't wait for your questions because that's what I really thrive on. And I can't wait for your answers as well, because this presentation is more of a let's talk about what's possible. Let's imagine things together. So the world that I like to imagine is this. No one is disconnected. There is always a place to go. There is always a place for people to feel that they can drop their guard that they can cry and be held in a sacred space, that they can heal together, that they can grow together, that their skills are always accepted, that they can contribute in valuable ways and that they can really not fear the future, but actively create and manifest what they want to create. And if you follow me and if you know me, you know that I'm kind of critical of manifestation theories and I'll, I'll explain why. Mainly because I work with highly traumatized populations and I am highly traumatized myself. So you can't blame those populations and you can't blame me for not manifesting perfectly. I mean, how can you when you have layers and layers of trauma? And so, you know, there's financial trauma, there's physical trauma, there's emotional trauma, there's intellectual trauma, there's spiritual trauma. There's so much trauma that can push down on a person. And you're telling that person, oh, you're just thinking the wrong way. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, you know, there's so much that has to be healed through community that has to be healed through safe community in order for someone to even begin to start thinking that they have any power at all. And that's kind of a first step. So a lot of times when I meet these community college students, if I just told them, oh, your thinking is off and you need to manifest better, <laughs> they probably fall apart and drop my class. You know, like they need, they need basic skills to get to that point of just writing down one dream and goal or even believing that they're worthy of the smallest goal. And that's, that's something that people have to really wrap their head around, you know, like we get into these high level um, ideas about manifestation, like, you know, I want all this money, I want my great life, I want, you know, this great um, platform, blah, blah, blah. And there are people out there who don't even know if they can manifest a car to get to school, if they can manifest a um, you know, a nervous system that will allow them to concentrate in school because of what all they have been through. And that when you get involved with people at that level, then you realize, oh, okay, there's a lot more to this theory than simply, you know, think about uh, what you want and start manifesting it. I mean, it, there, to some degree, it's important. And what I do teach students is to write down that goal, to think about it, and to start learning. So that process of learning is long. Sometimes it's not a, a short process. And I think one thing that that I've experienced as a near-death experiencer, and that's why I'm really, really just open about my journey, is when you've gone to the other side on some level you are like totally aware of that realm but then when you're back in your life you still have to navigate it and you still have to navigate around family members who disapprove around a society that disapproves you have to navigate 
around a lot of different problems. And so you don't come across as enlightened at all. <laughs> you come across as someone in survival mode. And I'm clearly aware of that. And so I would never want to be anyone's guru. I want to be someone's coach, you know, like, hey, if I got through this, you can get through this. And I want to be someone's uh, guide to deepening intuition. And that for me has been a profound journey as well. So what is following intuition? Um, for me, it's one thing, for you, it might be another. And in community, we can figure that out. And that's another like important part to all of this is I think that as we start imagining together and we start manifesting together, then the world will begin to shift because we can't do it alone. You know, that's the old model. That's the competitive model of, hey, I just manifested this great house and this great career and this blah, blah. But what about the rest of the people around you? You know, like if you're not taking everyone with you, then is it really success? You know, that that's just that old model of we're not all one, you know, and one of the things that the near-death experience showed me is we are all one, you know, at this, and it's hard to put this into practice. There's so many things at that spiritual level that are obvious that once we get in, back into the body, it's very challenging. And one of those is that oneness experience. I just saw that at the heart, no matter how people were behaving and choosing to behave that everyone was good and I know that's such a hard concept when you think of mass murderers and you think of pedophiles and you think of the worst of society you think of really really you know like horrible people that we look at and how do we shift that well what I think, and you know, we can discuss this and talk about this, is the more compassionate societies and what I've seen, the, you know, the European way of, of um, putting people in isolation, but in nature, when they have committed murder, you generally see a shift, you know, that when people are given time to think and they're not tortured through a prison system, then generally they orient back to something a little better than who they were when they created that drama and that crime and that, that horror. So as hard as it is, you know, that punishment model isn't working. I certainly believe that, you know, their communities should not allow abuse. I'm very clear about that. You know, I'm very clear that people should be protected, but I'm not for this model of torturing people. Um, that's never going to make them better. We don't have the answers yet for how to cure some of these ills in society, but we do know that nature is healing. That's one of the messages from my near-death experience. So why are prison systems not closer to nature? Why are juvenile centers not closer to nature where kids can put their hands in the dirt, grow some vegetables, orient themselves back to what is true because if we get rid of all religion if we get rid of all denominations and we just go what do we know from the ground up we know that when it rains we get wet we know that when we we are standing a lightning storm that we see the power of nature we know certain things to be true so i think this message of returning to nature is also a first step in community. How do you orient people back to health? So a spiritual community focused on nature, focused on service, focused on working together is just profound for me. And I think that that's a, a key component and play because, you know, I see it in, in teenager and young adult people's eyes, but you know, when I've taken them to clean up the river, we go outside to meditate. There's this joy that happens in the eyes of, of these young students when they get away from technology and we just sit outside there again, their dial starts shifting to something that is more playful. And we've all seen someone's eyes light up when they play with a pet or they go to a nature center. So play is another component of, of all of this. So what is the 
the community that I would like to see form from near-death experiencers. One where we're, we're united, one where, you know, one person is not more enlightened than another, but you just realize we're all on a journey. There was a time when I was an audience member, then there was a time when I just went to my local group, and there was a time when National Geographic covered my story, and I started a YouTube channel, and, you know, now I have a spiritual community. Maybe I'll go back into isolation. <laughs> like, you never know what the journey is, but I would like it to be a journey of community.